Welcome back to our second lesson in Genesis. We're looking at the creation. And the uh, first part of Genesis obviously deals with the patriarchal age before the flood. In the beginning, 1 verse 1 and 2, six days of creation, 1, 3 to 31. Remember the Bible is a library of books. The book of beginnings, general facts. The first book of the Bible, the book of origins, first book of the Pentateuch, the book of the law. Author, Moses, inspired by God. Main theme, man's sin and steps take for man's redemption through a divine covenant with God. Book of Genesis is split up into different areas and we'll come across them in the days that lie ahead. So, in the beginning, God, Genesis 1 and 2 says, God created the heavens and the earth. The word Genesis is synonymous with beginnings. When we speak of the genesis of a thing, we are referring to its origins. The book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. The beginning of the heavens and the earth. The beginning of mankind. The beginning of marriage and the family. The beginning of sin and death. The beginning of the nations. The beginning of the people of Israel. Genesis is foundational to the Bible. Every major theme within the Bible finds its origins in Genesis. Indeed, the rest of the Bible will be incomprehensible without the doctrinal foundation which is set down in this first book. The title and the outline of the book. The Hebrew title. The Old Testament, including Genesis, was originally written in Hebrew. The Hebrews commonly took the first line of a book and made that the title. Thus, they call this book the in the beginning. The Greek title, our title Genesis, is taken from the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the original Hebrew Bible. Genesis, it means beginnings. That's a good title for this book. In the Septuagint, the phrase Biblios, Genesis, is found nine different times. Each time it's translated, these are the generations of. The book of Genesis has its own internal outline which is based upon the repetition of the same phrase, these are the generations. Notice there's a symmetrical pattern which finds Abraham at its center later on. Adam, Abraham and Israel and Egypt. Thus, the first person of, the person of Abraham stands at the centre and is a pivotal point in the book of Genesis. He is the father of the nation through whom all the world is to be blessed. Abraham stands in contrast to Adam, through whom sin entered into the world. The first 11 chapters of Genesis form a prologue to the rest of the Pentateuch. This prologue is worded in cosmic terms, taking in all of mankind and all of the world. The New Testament counterpart to Genesis is probably the book of Revelation, which is introduced in the, what is introduced in the book of Genesis finds its conclusion in the book of Revelation. Throughout Genesis we see God's blessing and provision for man. Man's failure to grasp hold of that grace, ironically, this is illustrated by comparing the first and last verses of the book. Genesis begins with God. In the beginning God created. Genesis ends with a corpse in a coffin in Egypt. This doesn't mean that Genesis is a book without hope, for even in recording the death and burial of Joseph in Egypt, there's a continuing promise of a redemption to come. God and the world religions. The intention of the creation account, as a person mixes with people of different religions and persuasions, we find that people think differently of God. We would like to discuss how much the creation account might touch upon these two issues, followed by a summary. Creation, a polemic account, creation and views of God. Creation, a polemic, a polemic a account, a God above gods. First, we need to think, about, think through what the ancients might have thought about Genesis. 
It's proposed that Genesis is written as a defensive treatment, a treatise for God. In other words, the Genesis creation account was specifically designed to show God's power over the gods of the ancient world. Moses, for example, well understood the Egyptians' tendency to turn virtually everything into a god to be revered. One god in ancient times before Judaism, we don't know much about monotheism, the acknowledgement of the only one god. The ancient cultures were dominated by polytheism, that is, the idea of many gods. The introduction of only one god would astound those in these big uh, cities. Today, with Christianity, Islam and Judaism, we take monotheism for granted. But back then, the creation, it was a startling suggestion, the creation account is remarkable. As we read through the creation account, we can imagine that the objects that are listed as created are made by God, are worshipped by people in those times. They worshipped fish, people, sun, moon, and all kinds of animals. Yet, Genesis says that God made everything. The creation account is, in one blow cripples the case for polytheism. The names of luminaries are perhaps not mentioned because they were names for gods that were then worshipped. God's origin is never mentioned. Everything is said to come from him. Thus, there are no rivals to his power or authority. The Greeks, for example, believed that the gods came into existence at the same time as the world. Genesis teaches that time and matter all come into being at his supreme command to do whatever he desires. God is not dependent upon the world, but the world and everything in it, including man, is totally dependent upon him. He is a self-existing one. Matter is different from God. God is a personal God. He has a will, and thus it's not some mere encompassing power. In the Chaldean myth, we find Bel cuts the woman and makes heaven and earth by two halves. He then cuts his hand, and from the drops of blood, man is made. Genesis tells us God created man from the dust. He's not made from God, but from matter. In many ancient accounts, man is said to be a slave of God, whereas in the biblical account, man, men are stewards or viceroys of God's world. That they may know that you are alone, whose name is Lord, are most high over all the earth. There are three perspectives uh, people have towards God, or, or God force, or God being. Uh, how are we to understand God of creation with many other religions and philosophies in the world? For a most basic framework, we can divide the views into either personal, impersonal, and an absolute denial of God. The similarity to the Babylonian creation account, scholars have made much of the fact that there are other creation accounts in other cultures that predate Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness. Of particular interest in one is such account as the Inumilish found in Mesopotamia. It was customary in the very earliest written history to name a book or scroll after the first word or phrase found in the body of the work. The Inumilish, when and high, draws his title from the first sentence of his narrative. When and high, the heaven had not been named, firm ground below had not been named. The text was found written on seven tablets, but this has no bearing on the seven days of Genesis account. If the tablets had been larger, there would only have been six. The Illumina Ish Elish went on high, the most primitive forces and gods came together as a result of the rage of the sea goddess Taimat. Marduk, one of the second generation gods, is elected to fight Timak. The assembly of the gods decrees the outcome of the battle and the glory of Marduk. They each create seven assistants to help them. Marduk wins the conflict and dissects the body of Timak. From the body of Timak, Marduk creates heaven and earth. <coughs> Timak's second in command, Kingu, is slain, and from drops of his blood, Marduk creates a man, so there will be one, one sacrifice to the gods and Tablet 7 contains a list of the magical names of Marduk. It can be seen from this brief outline that this account is only superficially related to the Genesis account. Since the initial discoveries of the seven tablets, other copies have been found relating to the same story, but on ten tablets. <coughs> there is a real difference between the Genesis account and the creation accounts of other pagan religions. In other ancient religious systems, the natural world was seen as a manifestation of all the deities, the sun, the moon, the stars, the oceans and the storms. 
<clears throat> the cosmos always had the status of deity. The Bible is unique in that the cosmos is merely a creation. Only God is God. Monotheism, God is above the world as creator. Polytheism, many gods live around the world, idols and animistic. Personal God, a God has a will, he is an entity such as a person we might know. There are two major kinds of personal deities, one great God and many smaller gods. Monotheism, God is above the world as creator. When we categorize the different religions, we perhaps could do this by discerning whether they acknowledge a creator or not. Those that do, do will be monotheistic religions, which affirm one true transcendental God, separate from and in control over the world, this man and man. This includes Judaism, Christianity and Islam. The worldview generates an obligation of worship towards this God, but more than often because God is holy. Man must seek reconciliation because of their sins. Compromise is not tolerated, but only obedience. They see the world as God's gift. Unfortunately, many seek a way of reconciliation, reconciliation through works, rather than through God's provision in Christ Jesus. Polytheism. Many gods live around the world. Polytheism associates special godlike spirits attached to different parts of the world. Some believe in the sun god or the tree god. The creation account would scoff at such a view of God and the world as totally inadequate. These beliefs, though, less common today, can still be found in many places. The worldwide view generates fear and suspicion of the world. Nothing can be known for sure. They are busy trying to appease whatever God that may cause them trouble. They are scared of the world. Another form of this polytheism is humanism where man exalts himself as a sole determiner of what he does in life. In this case, we would have as many gods as people fighting against each other. The god of creation laughs at a man who dares to claim such self-determination. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless, Isaiah says. God's penetrating tooth, man senselessly tries to swim against the powerful stream of truth, Proclaimed by God in creation, judgment ultimately awaits him. God in the world's religions, impersonal God, pantheism, God is the God of the world, the force. God is a spirit force in the world, popularised perhaps by the science fiction series. World soul, God is a spirit force, no real world. An impersonal God, an impersonal God unlike above has no will or purpose, at least not in the way that we think. Many times people associate a will with force, but that would make it a person. People do not want to live in an impersonal world. There are at least two major kinds of impersonal God. The majority of pantheists see God everywhere, or at least in every living thing. For the most part they see matter as evil and spirit as good. They want to link their immaterial part, soul, with the great spirit or force. Their worldwide view asks them, to reject the world as evil, and it tends to asceticism or philosophical religion. The force, God, is spirit force in the world. People believe a force dominates the world, such as a sun tends to send its energy to the world. This is more of a science fiction idea, but seems rather popular. The world soul, God is spirit force, no real world. Although this is close to pantheism, there are certain kinds that deny any sort of world existentialism. All is just an illusion. These religions, such as proper Hinduism or Christian scientists, recognize that the power of the universe has no personal nature or will. Man's job is to align himself with this important personal power. No God. Atheists, secularists, some religious philosophers. They, they deny the spiritual world. This is a large crazy group of people who deny the existence of God or gods at, 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 at all. They say gods don't exist, but in fact, deep down, the scriptures say they believe there is some kind of eternal power. Uh, they, they go beyond uh, what they actually say that they believe. We see their words in Psalm 53 verse 1. God says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. 
Secularism flagrantly denies the supernatural world and instead comes up with a solution to man's problem by political means, Marxism, communism, socialism, scientific means, science and evolution, or other means, just ecology. These people live by the religion called humanism, where man is exalted as the chief centre of authority. They have made themselves as God and worship and please their own senses without any fear of the ultimate God. They, in fact, belong more accurately under polytheism, many man-gods, each demanding respect and acceptance. Summary of man's responsibility, the world is a stage of meeting and understanding God, so that man's place in the world, future, will be determined. Each person is personally accountable for what he or she does. It will impact their future. As maker, God holds man accountable. Sounds very much like what we're uh, a lot of people are saying today, even though they don't believe in God, they're saying we look, need to look after the world in which you live. Well, God said that right at the beginning. That's what he made us for. God is responsible to right all situations, therefore he is judge. Man must discern God's purpose for him and follow it. Many people think that if a person doesn't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, then they will not be judged. <laughs> this is not what Paul taught in Romans. The Apostle Paul explains in Romans 1, 18-21 that the creation provides such a powerful display of, display of God that man is inexcusable for his supposed lack of knowledge. God is revealed by creation and revelation and man's conscience. Although man tries to prove his irresponsibility towards God's presence and commands, everything fights against him. He suppresses the truth, but it faithfully keeps springing up. That which is known about God is evident within him. His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen and understood through that which has been made, so they are without excuse. God reveals his truth. All men, even the ones that never heard the gospel, are accountable for their behaviour before their maker. God's cre creation is regularly calling out that man might worship God. We don't mean just go to church but to acknowledge God and do his will. The revelation of creation, non-stop, calls men to follow Jesus. Genesis 1 verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Some say this not, may not mean the beginning of the present regime of human experience. Some believe that the universe was thrown into a state of darkness and chaos from an earlier period in history. The Hebrew tense can be translated had created the heavens and the earth. Young's literal translation, in the beginning of God's preparing the, universe, the heavens and the earth, the earth had existed waste and void and darknesses on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God fluttered in the face of the waters. I personally don't believe there was a previous creation that was destroyed and regenerated. I believe the creation was a singularity. There's nothing in the rest of the Bible that would indicate that the universe was remade, redone. Most of the, perhaps one of the most sublime sermons on creation ever preached was not from a pulpit, from, but from Apollo 8 spacecraft as it orbited the Earth. It was Christmas Eve, 1968, when astronaut Frank Borman, a lay reader of the congregation of St. Christopher's Episcopal Church in Houston, appeared on television from lunar orbit. Pointing the camera out the window so that the entire world could be seen we could see the bleakly grey and deadly dead moon passing quickly underneath the spacecraft. He said, And now the crew of Apollo 8 has a message we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And with that, he and the other two Apollo astronauts proceeded to read Genesis 1. In the, heaven, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first verse of the Bible tells us God is the creator. The time of the creation was in the beginning. Scientists now recognize six components which make up the world. Time, force, energy, space, matter and motion. All these components are in the very first words of the Bible. In the beginning, time, God, force, created, energy, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. Solar movement of the planets, described in verses 14 and 19, motion. 
when the, the crater in the beginning, we are not told when this took place, with reference to our own modern system of dating. I understand that some old Bibles have placed a date in the margin as to when this was computed to have taken place. But the simple fact is that the Bible is silent concerning the exact date. What it does tell us is that the creation took place in the beginning. That is significant. It means that the creation of which we read was a true creation. If this is what took place at the beginning, then it indicates the universe is not infinitely old. Whether you want to stipulate that the creation took place thousands of years ago or billions of years ago, the truth remains that there was a time when nothing existed and then something came into being. But what about before the beginning? This verse gives the answer. In the beginning, God. God didn't come into existence at creation, rather he was already existence at creation. The who of the creation, in the beginning, God. The Hebrew word here for God is Elohim. That's the interesting thing about Elohim is that it's plural. El is a singular form for God. It's found in, in the Old Testament, but it's not as common, only about 250 times. Elohim is the more common designation of God. It may be an indication of deity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it's also a device known as a plural of immensity, used to describe God in terms of his greatness. Although Elohim is a pure, plural world, it's accompanied by a singular verb. While God is plural, created is singular. This verse teaches us several things about God. It teaches of the existence of God, that God is, he exists. The writer of Genesis doesn't argue this point. It's not open for debate. He does not begin his book <clears throat> with five points of proving the existence of God. The very fact that anything exists is evidence that God exists. It teaches of the existence of one God. I show you this chapter, we, be, we should remember, it was written to an original audience with a very specific purpose. <clears throat> the writer was Moses, he was writing to the Israelites in the wilderness. They lived all their lives as slaves in Egypt. And in Egypt, let me rephrase that, they'd lived... Well, this bunch had, yes. They had lived all their lives as slaves in Egypt, and Egypt had been exposed to pagan pantheon of Egyptian gods. They had heard the Egyptian creation myths, which described the heavens and earth being the domain of all the false gods of Egypt. It teaches the pre-existence of God. God not only existed in the creation, he pre-existed at the creation. He was not the recipient of creation, he was the source of creation, and that presupposes that he already existed prior to the creation. The New Testament makes this very clear. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This passage also takes us back to the creation, but there's a difference. <clears throat> the emphasis here is not upon being God creating, but rather upon God's existence, his being. Here we read that in the beginning something already was. When you go back in time, as far as you can possibly imagine, before every, anything else ever existed, God was. John doesn't say that in the beginning the world came into being. Instead, it tells us that at the time of the beginning, the world already, the world already was. The world pre-existed the beginning. This is seen in three statements of John. The world pre-existed. The world pre-existed with God. The world pre-existed as God. It teaches us of the person of God. God is not some mystical, impersonal force that makes good science film, fiction in a film like Star Wars, <coughs> but it's, which is terrible theology. God is personal. He thinks. He feels. He acts. Question for discussion. What is, does in the beginning mean? Beginning of what? Did anything or anyone exist before the beginning? Where did God come from? If God is one, why is the word for God in Genesis a plural word? Can you explain the concept of deity, trinity? Discuss the nature of deity. What are some attributes of deity? What do you think God meant when he said to Moses, I am who I am. I am what I am. Discuss the possibility that there was an orderly universe in existence before the darkness and chaos described here came into being. Is there a parallel universe? Angels? In the beginning when God created the earth initially, formless and empty, the solar system was formed from amorphous gas cloud. 
darkness as the cloud collapsed, it became denser and darker, cloud begins to glow as it ionizes, and the equatorial band is pushed outside flow, uh, glow, rotating planets of daylight significance, day-night significance. So the work of creation God created. How are we to understand the work of creation as described in verse 1 as it relates to the rest of the chapter? There are two possibilities. An initial act of creation, this would see the statement of verse 1 as relating to what God did in the beginning, and then the six days of forming and filling would tell of God's continuing work at that later time. A summary statement, this view sees the typical Hebrew parallelism that runs through all Genesis as a brief overview statement is made at the first verse, is then followed by a description of how God created the heavens and the earth. It's perhaps worth, perhaps worth noting, noticing that the four different Hebrew words are used within these two chapters to describe God's creative activity. Bara, to create. Genesis 1 describes God creating the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.21 uses the same word to describe God creating the sea creatures and the birds. And 127, it relates to the creation of man and woman, the same word. Asa, to make. This word is used to describe God creating of the expanse, the two great lights, the beasts of the earth and man, all of creative work, the earth um, and woman. Asa, to make, continued. It must make not make this word say too much, for in other places used for woman giving birth. At the same time, there does seem to be a careful distinction between the word and the others that are used in this chapter to describe God's creative works. That's at the form, used in Genesis 2, 7 to 8, to describe the forming and moulding of a man's body. However, we should not read too much of a distinction in this, because Zechariah 12, verse 1, uses the same word to describe forming, God forming man's spirit. Bana, to build, used in Genesis 2, 22, to describe the making of the woman from the side of man. There are theories of creation. The supernaturalist naturalist says that creation occurred in a way that is completely foreign to anything that may be observed today. It is completely foreign. The creation account indicates that God has completed his creative work. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. On the other hand, there are those who believe that God may have acted through evolutionary means to create his creation, to bring about his creation. It's true that God often works through what we think of as natural processes. They are in reality his regular and faithful working. A superficial appearance of history, the description that we have of God's creative work seem, seems to imply creation as an appearance of age. This is vividly seen in the creation of man. On the day that Adam was created, how old was he? He was one day old. But the scriptures seem to describe him as a full-grown man rather than as a baby. The implication is that he was created with the appearance of age. The same is seen of animals and plant life. We do not read that God created seedlings, but rather he created trees yielding fruit that had within them seeds for perpetuity perpetuating further growth. When were the children we used to discuss that came first? When were children we used to discuss what came first, the chicken or the egg? The biblical answer is that God created egg-laying chickens that looked and acted every bit like those who had been hatched and grown to adulthood. This view places a great chronological the gap theory. This view places a great chronological gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2 during which, they say, the earth was destroyed and then recreated. According to this theory, millions of years ago, God created a perfect heaven and earth. This universe continued in a perfect state until Satan rebelled by desiring to become God. Because of Satan's fall, sin entered the universe. As a result, the earth became formless and void until a global ice age swept over the earth as light and heat were removed. The six days which followed then refer to the reconstruction of the earth. The support for this theory. Genesis can be translated became, so we read the earth became without form and void. The normal rend rendering of this word is was and indicates a state of being. The words tohu wabohu, formless of void, are said to refer to destruction which took place after God's original creation. The words formless of void need not describe destruction, they can just easily describe an unconstructed state. 
In Isaiah 45, 18, God didn't create the, the word void, tofu. While Genesis 1, verse 2 says the word was now void, it's reason, reason that the earth must have come into this matter after its original creation. And yet a proper context reading of Isaiah 45, 18 simply tells us God's intention for the earth in its completed form was it would not be tofu, but rather it might be inhabited. The prophet is simply stating the purpose of creation. The darkness which characterized the former's void condition is indicative of evil. Uh, darkness doesn't always indicate evil. Both light and darkness existed upon a finished earth and were still said to be good. There's a day-age theory. The view says that six days of creation are not to be taken as literal days, but rather as symbolic for long periods of time. The support for the theory, the word day is sometimes used in the scripture to describe a longer period than a 24-hour period. The day of the Lord, for example. The word objection, the word day doesn't normally refer to an extended period of time, but for when it appears a modifier, for example, first day, second day, third day, etc. Uh, support for theory, 2 Peter 3 verse 8 states that the Lord, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. Uh, against that, these days are clearly defined in Genesis 1 verse 5. When God calls the light day and the darkness night, he's talking about day and night. And uh, support for theory, the sun and moon are not created until the fourth day, indicates that the previous days are not literal. Uh, the answer for that is the very purpose of the sun was to rule over the day while the moon was to rule the night. So there must have been days and nights for the sun and moon to rule over. The day age theory continued. It should be noted this view had, was held by some theologians long before the advent of modern evolutionary theory. Oregon, Augustine, Aquinas were among some of the early theologians who suggested that the days of Genesis might not necessarily be limited to a 24-hour period. It's a non-sequential theory. It says that the first two chapters of Genesis are not meant to teach us anything about a chronological order of creation, and that we should only learn general lessons from these chapters. The creation week is seen merely as a literary device, a framework, in which a number of very important messages are held. Uh, there's a number of good writers about that. Thus, the chronological sequence is merely to be regarded as packaging in which the real message is wrapped. Our literal interpretation, if we read the passage naturally, we seem to see a literal six-day period of creation, since the entire the idea of a day and a night is defined within the passage, where God called the light day. For this reason, this has been the accepted interpretation from both Jewish and Christian scholars throughout most of history. Most of the other interpretations of Genesis have had their motivating force at uh, the desire to bring the teachings of this chapter into line with the popular modern geological and evolutionary theory. This is not a bad thing if those modern theories can be demonstrated to be correct. But we have done similar works of interpretation when we take archaeological discoveries into account and use them to help us to understand and to interpret, it, interpret scripture. For example, when Isaiah 11 verse 12 speaks of the Lord gathering his people from the four corners of the earth, we utilize our understanding of geography to interpret this as a figure of speech, rather than insist the planet as literally four corners. One wonders why there's so much time spent on whether the days in Genesis are true days, as we know them or not. There are many today who still deny a literal day. The basic reason these people deny literal days is to bring scientific knowledge under the umbrella of Christian teaching. With good motives, they fear that if, if what they discovered, that which did not agree with the scriptures, then they would need to give up their faith. But their faith is weak and inconsistent. Their arguments have done much to harm many Christians. For example, at one time evolutionists had us all believing that man evolved and used different link fossils to prove it. Now their work is proven untrue. Many of the books don't mention these fossils anymore. As discoveries have widened, they've discovered how cells work. The complication chemical gene structure couldn't have just evolved. Scientists, many scientists are abandoning gradual evolution. The cell function as a wonderfully efficient factory that could not have come by chance, changes the whole ballgame. These proponents of non-literal days assert that a day could mean any time period. 
During the days of the early 20th century, evolutionary proponents seemed to have an edge on facts that went contrary to the scripture. But with further research, we're seeing the truth always supports the truth. We should trust God's word and just wait and all these things that seem incompatible with what God's word says, eventually they'll catch up. Others are ensnared by the geological strata. They're convinced of the age of the rocks denying God's word. So they change God's word. We just don't know enough. Interesting scientific research at the University of Arizona shows that the supposed time needed to lay such strata couldn't be done, could be done rather rapidly using, for example, Mount Helena's volcano, volcano as an example. We now know that the Grand Canyon in America was made in less than a year rather than the millions of years that evolution have claimed. Their repeatable experiments demonstrate just what we see in our strata today. We simply need more time to understand God's ways. We must not depart from God's word. Oil can be produced from organic material in 20 minutes. Fossilization can take place in less than 50 years. Many thin strata layers are now interpreted to have taken days rather than thousands of years. Some still scared about this suggest that the scriptures can be taken either way. <clears throat> what about time? The early church father St. Augustine said about whether there was time before creation. He says, I know well enough what it is, provided that nobody asks me. But if I'm asked what it is and try to explain, I'm baffled, he said. The concept of create and creation is preserved for us all the way through God's word, all confirming a genuine creation by God. Besides, note Jesus' own words. Jesus said to him, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote to you this command. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Back in my father's day, it took 10 days to arrive across the Australian outback during the day. Use of the word day outside of Genesis. The Bible, nothing else. Thousands of years, death after sin, little Genesis, creation, corruption, catastrophe and confusion. Man plus the Bible, man's fallible dating methods. Uh, yeah, millions of years, theistic evolution, the gap theory, progressive creation, other compromising positions. Death even before sin. And God bless the seventh day and made it holy because of it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is probably, as I said there in, in my last lesson, this is a really important passage that many people overlook. Here is God creating his people or, or uh, organizing his people based upon a foundation uh, of truth and solid, solidity. Uh, and to deny this passage means that uh, he based the whole purpose of his new, new nation on a lie. Modern science relates to creation. Modern science is based upon three principles. Interestingly, and interestingly all three had its origin or, or in or were consistent with Christian teaching. First, the world is real and the human mind is capable of knowing real nature. Second, the structure of science is based upon cause and effect. And third, nature is unified. Christian scientists who were founders of key creation or scientific principles. Isaac Newton with dynamics, uh, Kepler with astronomy, Boyle with chemistry, Kelvin with thermodynamics, Pasteur with bacteriology, and Faraday with electromagnets. Even non-Christian scientists can apply these principles from creation to the work and make discoveries. If they do not believe in God though, they are not embarrassed using Christian teaching to live out their lives. They are living by faith. If we have so much confidence in the world God made, maybe we ought to put more trust in God who made and sustains the universe. I hope you've uh, gained something from this study and if so, please feel free to come back and join us again.